Good afternoon, Mr. Leach. How are you today? Motherfucking night in paradise. Glad to hear it. My name is Dr. Lemus, and I'm here to talk to you about your case. You know, I've been through this rodeo once or twice before. Can't you just read what the last guy wrote? I mean, I assume you suits take notes once in a while. I'm not interested in what other doctors think, Mr. Leach. I'm interested in your side. <laughs> you want my fucking side? All right. 27 murders. October, four years ago. All evidence points to me. All suspicions lie with me. There was somebody else there. Somebody who came and went like a fucking ghost. Like the wind, like the dark. One second they're there, the next, gone. But of course, the justice system, not really interested in stories of the boogeyman. The facts, Doc, I was found in a pool of blood, very little of which was my own. 35 years to life, and that clock is ticking, ticking away. So stop wasting my fucking time like everyone before you. Stamp your little form, criminally insane, and let me go back to my cell. Because I'm sick of reliving this shit. I'm afraid you're going to have to relive it. Oh yeah? And why is that? Because he's back. So John Carpenter's Halloween tells the story of Michael Myers who as a young child murdered his own sister and has now escaped from an insane asylum and stalks babysitters on Halloween night. Welcome everybody to the Halloween review series. This has been a long time coming. Technically the first two Halloween films were the first like classic horror movies that I ever reviewed on this channel. I actually already have a review for this movie on my channel. But it was back in the day when I was still figuring out what the fuck I was doing. Uh, I still agree with pretty much everything I said in those reviews, but I feel like I shortchanged the movie because my style has changed. I go much more in depth now. I just put a lot more into my reviews nowadays. So especially with this new Halloween 2018 coming here in a couple of weeks, I felt like it's time to revisit those two reviews and finally finish the Halloween franchise. So. Halloween Season of the Witch, all the way through a Rob Zombie's Halloween 2 will also be getting reviews on this review series, and I will be ending on the Halloween 2018 review, probably on the 18th or the 19th, depending on how lucky I am and how soon I'll be able to see that new movie. So, strap in guys, because we're going to be talking Michael Myers for the next two weeks. So it goes without saying, this is one of those movies that's like, what else can you possibly say about John Carpenter's Halloween? This is one of the greatest horror movies, one of the greatest movies ever made. Extremely important to not only horror, but especially if you're a slasher fan, slasher films. Halloween, for all intents and purposes, gave us the horror slasher craze of the 80s. It's all because of this movie. Yes, Psycho came first and technically was like the first slasher, the first mainstream slasher, and Halloween picked it up from there. But Halloween just kicked open the door. Franchises like Friday the 13th and A Nightmare on Elm Street, all these classic franchises that we all know and love, we have John Carpenter and Michael Myers to thank for that to some degree. And at the time, John Carpenter, really the most prominent thing he had done to that point was Assault on Precinct 13. When they had the idea for Halloween, the only concept they had was, let's make a horror movie, set it on Halloween, and call it Halloween. Here you go, John Carpenter, here you go, Deborah Hill. Go 
do whatever you want with that concept, let's make a movie. And just that setup right there, the most vague of directions, gave birth to one of the most iconic horror films ever made. John Carpenter and Deborah Hill went to work on the script. John Carpenter obviously took over directing duties. You had the character of Michael Myers, the whole concept of him being this child murderer, just one day a switch goes off. Fast forward into the future, you have Dr. Loomis that's been trying to contain the evil for years. Finally, he escapes one night and unleashes hell on Haddonfield, Illinois. That was all birthed out of go make a horror movie and set it on Halloween. And honestly, the biggest tool that this movie had in its arsenal was John Carpenter himself. So we're gonna talk about him. John Carpenter has made a career, a legacy, of making just a ton of beloved, classic, landmark horror films off of the simplest premise. Halloween is probably the biggest example of that. Aside from the iconic characters, aside from the score, all these things that we're gonna be getting into as well, the thing that makes John Carpenter's Halloween stand out the most to me, especially amongst this franchise, which has a ton of different directions, a ton of varying qualities, a ton of different levels of gore, and different levels of quality in the direction, the thing that makes John Carpenter's Halloween stand out and continuously be the thing that not only a Halloween film, but most horror films get compared to even to this day in 2018, is just this simplistic approach that he took in his directing, the way that he chooses shots, the way that he just holds the camera still on certain things, the way that he chooses not to show you certain things to scare you more, the way that he utilizes the camera to show how Michael Myers is just as much human as he is supernatural, how he is like a force of nature. He's the embodiment of evil. This is not just a guy that escaped, threw on a mask, and decided to have some fun. This is evil incarnate that has one night to unleash hell upon Haddonfield. Just shots like Michael Myers standing outside of a window in the blowing wind with a bunch of sheets and he just has this locking stare on you with that deadpan, white, pale, emotionless, evil canvas that is his mask. Just shots like that. Shots like whenever he steps behind a bush and he's just staring at you from afar and then he just kind of takes a sidestep and you never see him again. He's gone. He's gone like the wind. Hey, look. Look where? Behind the bush. Shots like whenever Laurie Strode, my favorite shot in the movie, honestly, probably my favorite shot in the entire franchise, if I'm going to be honest, when she's standing next to this darkened, open door, shocked with all the dead bodies that she just found, and Michael Myers' mask just slowly comes into view with like a little one watt bulb that just slowly lights, and you see his face just come through the shadows. <laughs> Shit like that, so simple, but so effective in making not only Michael Myers an effective killer and an icon, but making Halloween just a phenomenal horror film. And while we're talking about him, let's just talk about the man himself, Michael Myers. Why is Michael Myers such an icon? Why is Michael Myers still relevant in 2018? Why when they put up a trailer that says Halloween is coming back, motherfuckers, everybody who is a horror fan, and even people who aren't maybe horror fanatics, stand up and go, yeah, Michael's back, bitch. Why is that? What is it about this guy, this person that doesn't talk, that for all intents and purposes is this blank canvas of a performance and no face that walks around, doesn't utter a single word, except for the director's cut of one film, which that's gonna be down the line. We'll talk about it, don't worry. What is it about him that makes him iconic? And it is that simplistic approach of just this blank canvas of evil. It sounds like it should be more than that. It sounds like there should be something else beneath the surface that makes Michael so appealing even 40 years later. But in my opinion, that's it. Anybody can put on a jumpsuit and a mask and walk around with a knife and be scary and effective depending on how well the director uses that person. But when you have a character like Michael Myers, when all the way back to the beginning of the movie, when it shows this backstory of this young, innocent child that for no reason whatsoever, one day, a switch goes off and he's no longer a boy anymore. He's no longer human anymore. He no longer has a sense of good 
or evil or right or wrong, and he just exists to embody evil. All of that is scary enough. You fast forward, you have that same person who's been sitting in an insane asylum waiting for his chance to come back and continue that evil, and he just throws on this mask that they bought for $2 and a fucking convenience store with like this last minute decision, all right, what's the mask gonna be? And they had this mask, they had this mask. Oh, let's, let's try the Star Trek mask. Let's throw William Shatner's face up there. We'll spray paint it white, you know, tease the hair out a bit. Let's see, maybe it'll work. And then just the sight of that mask coming out of this decrepit house, everybody's like, that is fucking Michael Myers. This blank white canvas that you can put whatever you want on there in your mind that has the black eyes that you should never see. Some movies choose to show you, but at least in John Carpenter's Halloween, it's just darkness there. Nothing. Emptiness. And then for the rest of the movie, Michael Myers is just this body, just walking around with seemingly no motive, selecting his victims seemingly at random, and at least as far as I'm concerned, should be random. I know what they do later on in the franchise, but randomly selecting his, vil uh, his victims and then just stalking them. Partly out of this childlike, like morbid curiosity about how they're gonna react when they see me and I'm no longer there anymore. I step behind this bush, maybe to check out how their you know, everyday life is before I put an end to it here in a couple of hours. Just watching people, just stalking them, just building up to the kill and that suspense and that tension that develops with that stalking, with that building up to the kill scene, which is usually the scenes that you're trying to get to quicker in your traditional slasher movie, John Carpenter's Halloween takes its time to get in there. It takes the opposite approach. It makes you cringe waiting for the kill to come. And that's what makes it stand out. That's what makes it remain at the top of the pack as far as this franchise and as far as most slashers go is that they make you linger with the killer and with the victims about just when the fuck is this dude gonna stab them? When is this gonna come? And it just takes its time getting there and it makes you be patient. And even down to the other aspects of Michael Myers, which I gotta give credit to Nick Castle who portrayed the shape in this original film, it's just, it's wild as hell and so unique to watch the certain little ticks of this person that never gets to speak. That's how Michael speaks through his performance is just by the different things that he does while he's killing, before he kills, after he kills, like probably my favorite kill in the movie, one of them the favorite kills in the franchise, when he stabs the dude against the fucking cupboards and then just lets him hang there, and then you just see that head nod, that childlike curiosity coming back again about, damn, that's kind of wild. I fucked that dude up. Woo, that was fun. And it's that weird childlike curiosity, that weird morbid sense of just this motiveless evil, this balance between man and supernatural, which you can never quite figure out which does the scale tip more on what side of. Is he equally both? Is he total supernatural that just looks like a man? Is he all man that just is so fucking whacked out of his head that he seems supernatural? The fact that he can't be stopped no matter what they throw at this guy. Knives, sewing needles, fucking the ends of a coat hanger, six bullets. Nothing stops Michael Myers. And it's all of that put together, the way that you execute him especially, that makes Michael Myers an icon. But moving on to the other characters, probably the second most iconic character in this franchise, there's a debate on that, but I will say the second most iconic character is Loomis, played by Donald Pleasant. Now this is the character that, in a lesser film, with a lesser director and a lesser writer, would be the exposition dump character. This is the character that pops his head in to tell you what Michael Myers is all about, what he's about to do, what makes him tick, and then pops his head out of the scene so that they can continue on with the main characters. But Loomis is everything but that. This is the character that comes in, that has spent years with Michael Myers, trying to reach him, trying to figure out why he is the way he is, trying to help him, and then once he realizes the futility in that, tries to keep the evil contained. And when the evil breaks out, Loomis is the one that makes Michael Myers scary because he's the one that tells the characters and tells you as the audience member why you should be scared of this guy. 
and it fucking works. I, I watched him for 15 years, sitting in a room, staring at a wall, not seeing the wall, looking past the wall, looking at this night in humanly patient, waiting for some secret silent alarm to trigger him off. Death has come to your little town, Sheriff. And it's all in the portrayal of Donald Pleasance. It's all in this guy's acting. It's the way that he has this charm about him, the way that he has this class, even though he could easily be this crazy ass old man, which is what most of these people see whenever they first meet Dr. Loomis and he's coming in screaming about, the evil is coming to your town. What the fuck ever, dude? When you see Donald Pleasance bring the character of Loomis, you're like, I fucking believe him. Evil is fucking here. Where's the evil at? And it's not only the way that he's able to convey the evil of Michael Myers and why you should be scared of him, but it's also kind of the charm of the fact that this guy has basically dedicated his life to keeping everybody safe from the evil of Michael Myers. And they explore it much more in the further films, but it's even a subtle thing that's here in John Carpenter's Halloween. This is a character that has no reason to be in the situation that he's in. He's not a cop, he's not an ex-marine, he's not here, he's not gonna go fuck Michael Myers up as soon as he sees him. He's there to do whatever he possibly can, be it how much, how little it is or how big it is, how much of a help he can be to these people. He is there to make sure that Michael Myers hurts as little people as possible. And it would be an understatement to say that pretty much every single line that comes out of Loomis's mouth is not only something that you could stitch into like some kind of a embroidery somewhere and put it on the walls of your man cave because they always are so badass, but they are easily the most iconic lines of this film and probably the entire franchise. I mean, the whole line about the devil's eyes. I met this six-year-old child with this blank, pale, emotionless face and the blackest eyes, the devil's eyes. And so many different things that comes out of Loomis's mouth is some of the best scenes of this movie. And Despite all the things you normally look for in a slasher movie, like the kills, the jump scares, the scenes when Michael comes out of the door and all this crazy stuff, the Sam Loomis lines are some of the things that Halloween fans look forward to revisiting the most when they pop in John Carpenter's original film. But moving on to our final girl who ends up becoming the heroine of this franchise later on, and that is Laurie Strode, portrayed by Jamie Lee Curtis. Now, I believe this was her first film. This was very, very early on in Jamie Lee Curtis's career. And she brings something to Laurie Strode that's like that classic cliche of innocence. You know, she's the virgin character. This was before it was a cliche because the 80s hasn't gotten a hold of it yet. But back in 1978, she was the innocent girl. She was the nice girl. She was the babysitter. The other two girls are the ones that's trying to ditch their kids that they have to watch and go fuck their boyfriends. Laurie Strode is the one that's responsible, trying to take care of the kids, trying to do her homework on time, gets upset because she left her chemistry book at school and the other two are like, I don't give a fuck, I leave my chemistry book, my Mac book, everything else, who cares, let's go fuck. And it's that innocence that brings the charm to the character of Laurie Strode. Now Laurie Strode, to be fair, is not like the most grand character in this first movie. It's not like she has this huge redemptive arc or this huge struggle or whatever. She's a seemingly random girl who you like the most out of the pack of girls that you get because of her innocence and because of the betrayal of Jamie Lee Curtis. And it's the way that she does survive the encounter of Michael Myers and does what she can to save the two kids and does what she can to survive this hell of a night. Even with Loomis coming up to help her at the very end, it's that kind of survival instinct that she has that makes her a great final girl that makes her one of the most iconic final girls and kind of makes Jamie Lee Curtis and the character of Laurie Strode have the moniker if you will of the screen queen the queen of the 80s the final girl you know whenever you think of the final girls or whenever you see like a poster or something whenever somebody starts talking about best final girls of all time you always hear Laurie Strode's name brought into it, and it's for all of those reasons. Now, I've already talked about it a lot with John Carpenter, but I do need to take a moment to give credit where credit is due to Dean Cundey, the cinematographer of this film, and that is why a lot of these iconic shots, these simplistic takes on these wide shots, are so iconic and so effective. You know, like the shots of behind Michael's shoulder when he steps out and is just watching the girls walk away. The thing that I was talking about with the, the light coming on and slowly bringing up Michael's face, that was all Dean Cundy. Even some of the camera work as far as like the opening whenever Loomis and the nurse are going into Smith's Grove and then the lightning flashes and you just see all of these white coat insane ass people that are just walking around free and you only see them for a split second when the light shines, when the lightning hits. Stuff like that, so simple, 
but so fucking awesome. And you have to talk about the score when you talk about Halloween. Now, Halloween is not my favorite John Carpenter score. That award goes to Christine, but Halloween's a damn close second. And regardless of what my favorite is, there's no disputing that Halloween, the score that John Car Carpenter developed for this movie, is probably, if not definitely, arguably, the most iconic, most recognizable, and most people's favorite horror score of all time. As soon as those piano keys hit, everybody, whether you're a fucking horror fanatic or you hate horror, you know who's coming. And one of the biggest things, especially that I noticed this most recent time rewatching this movie, Halloween has a great pacing. I mean, it just opens up with this morbid ass beginning where you're like, where the hell is this movie gonna go from here? There's a kid gonna be a murderer, we're following a little Chucky wannabe the rest of the movie. Fast forward, the dude just breaks out of this insane asylum, and then you got Sam Loomis telling everybody what the hell just broke out of here and how that evil of that little child has developed over the years into the man that just broke out of Smith's Grove. The second act is all about Michael kind of stalking his victims, getting his thing together, you know, getting his mask, figuring out what piece of Haddonfield he's about to fuck up while Samuel Loomis is trying to convince everybody that's an authority figure in Haddonfield what is about to go down. And then the third act is all Michael unleashing his hell, developing into the showdown between him and Laurie Strode, and eventually that iconic ending where Samuel Loomis comes in to save the day, shoots the fuck out of Michael Myers, he falls over this balcony. There's no humanly way possible anybody could survive that. And then within a few seconds, you look down, dude's gone. And while I have heard a few people in the younger generation that are just watching this movie for the first time that maybe don't have any intentions of watching the entire franchise get to that ending and think, well, wow, we're ending here. But here's the thing. That ending works so well as an ending to this movie, not as a setup for sequels like it seems to kind of come across for those that watch this with the intention of knowing that there's nine other films to watch, but if Halloween, John Carpenter's original film, just existed in its own little bubble and there was nothing coming after it, ever, this is it, the ending of this movie works phenomenally because it just reinforces that human and supernatural balance of Michael Myers about is this human or is this evil embodied? The way that the dude survives that and then gets up immediately after Sam Loomis turns his head around to give him a second to move. And then you just have the different shots of the inside of the house, the darkness of different closets, different walls, and you just hear Michael's breathing slowly, getting louder. <sighs> just reinforces that whole thing about you never know where Michael Myers is. He could be behind you, he could be in the next room, he could be next door. He is nowhere and he is everywhere at the same exact time. And that's what I love about this original film and the character of Michael Myers, the way that he's portrayed and the way that he's intended in this original John Carpenter's Halloween because it just strikes that perfect balance of supernatural and human. And that is when Michael Myers is at his scariest. And that's also the reason why I have a bone to pick with quite a few of these sequels over the way that they decided to continue the legacy of Michael Myers. And that's one of the reasons why I'm so excited for the way that they decided to go with this new Halloween movie, scrapping everything past this original film and getting back to that original human supernatural balance and tent of this character. No motives whatsoever, no family ties, nothing like that. It's just evil in a mask and that is what I love that is what I want to get back to so revisiting this movie always reminds me of why the original intent of this character and the way that John Carpenter executed him is by far the best incarnation of Michael Myers now moving on to a couple of negatives now these are extremely small negatives within the legacy of this film because I grew up watching this one I didn't grow up watching the franchise necessarily but John Carpenter's original film was always a staple for me. Even as a Freddy fanatic, I always rewatch John Carpenter's Halloween. But there are some things, rewatching it now in 2018, that has not aged awesomely. It doesn't ruin the movie at all. It's not even really a full on negative. It's just something that does stand out amongst the things that age beautifully about this film. And one of them is the acting for a couple of characters. One character you barely see in this movie, and that's Judith Myers in the opening of this movie. Acting's a little bit iffy with the way that she kind of has her death scene when she's getting stabbed and you hear the John Carpenter score and she just kind of goes, ah, and just falls down. It's a little bit old-fashioned when you watch it, especially for somebody that grew up watching most of the 80s slashers that kind of 
got away from that in some of the better films. When you watch this one, small little weird death scenes like that do stand out for about a second and then you forget about it. The other acting performance, which still does not really age very well, is Annie. Now, this character, again, like I said, it's not a huge negative. It doesn't ruin this movie by any means. It's not even really that distracting. It's just something that I noticed, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, she doesn't age as well as the other two characters. And it's just the way that she delivers her line. That, Lindsay! Say what you will about the Rob Zombie's Halloween. I will say that that is the one thing for sure, no matter what Halloween type of fan you are, you could probably agree with, is that Daniel Harris is a big step up from this version of Annie, because this version of Annie, while being effective at being kind of the, the floozy character who's not the full-on slut that the third friend is, when you get to Annie and you see just the way that she delivers some of these lines, the way that she interacts with two actresses who are clearly a little bit better than she is back in 1978, it just stands out slightly. And the only other thing that I will mention, again, it does not really full-on be a negative whenever I watch this movie, but it is something that is noticeable whenever you watch the entire franchise for sure, is that the kills in this movie do kind of come across as tame by today's standards. Now, we have gone way extreme since 1978, so pretty much a lot of shit in the 80s and the 90s seem kind of tame compared to where we are now in 2018. But even re-watching this film, when, when two of the kills are both strangulations, and even the one stab that we have, which is an awesome scene, but there's not really any kind of gore or anything like that, it does age the movie slightly as being kind of a tame first outing that was not really trying to focus on gore or even the creativity of the kills. It was trying to focus on everything else, which it does phenomenally. But amongst the franchise, when you get to Halloween 2 especially, which is just a couple years later, and you see how much the change is from the focus on the kills of John Carpenter's Halloween to the focus on the kills in Rick Rosenthal's Halloween 2, it does make Halloween seem tame amongst its own franchise. Again, not a negative, just something to throw out there as an asterisk. But beyond all that, guys, I mean, there's no denying, Halloween is the shit. This is a movie that is a yearly staple for me in October. I don't care what the hell I have to do, even if it's not on Halloween night. At some point between October 1st and November 1st, I'm watching this fucking movie. I'm gonna be watching it on the big screen here in a couple of days. It's one of those movies that I will get excited to go see on the big screen again. Even 40 years later, this is a landmark film that has an experience tied to it. And no time will ever diminish that. This is a timeless classic through and through. This gave birth to my favorite genre of film of all time. This is the second best film by one of my favorite directors of all time. Sorry, I'm a thing purist. And this is just one of those movies that gave birth to an iconic character that remains just as iconic as he was in 1978 in 2018, provided this movie's awesome. What's the boogeyman? As a matter of fact, it was. So if you're a fan of the slasher genre, if you're a fan of John Carpenter, if you want to know who the hell this Michael Myers guy is that everybody's all excited about now all of a sudden in 2018, and you are one of the three people in the world that have not seen John Carpenter's original Halloween film, get your ass out there right now. Go out and buy it. So what do you guys think of John Carpenter's Halloween? Is this your favorite movie of all time? Do you think this is the best in the franchise or do you actually have a sequel that you prefer over this? Do you agree with some of the little aging negatives that I have or you know, aging mixed elements I'll say, I shouldn't have said negative. Do you agree with any of those things or do you think this is a flawless film through and through everything about it and you think it's a timeless classic? Put all of your thoughts on John Carpenter's Halloween down in the comment section below and we will talk about it. And stay tuned because every single day following this review, you're going to get another Halloween review leading up to Halloween 2018. We are going through this whole franchise in 11 days, so strap in, people. Please like and share this video. Hit that subscribe button if you're not already a subscriber. If you want to check out some of my social media links, down below in the video description, you must go because I got Facebook, Instagram, Twitter down there. I've got my Spreadshirt store with for a lot of really cool Cody Leach merchandise like t-shirts, very cool designs that you guys will enjoy, and my Patreon page, which is a great way to give back to this channel, help this channel grow, and get cool exclusive content for your eyes only if you decide to become a patron. And if you want to check all that out, guys, please, or you could check out some of my videos like the rest of this Halloween review series if you're watching this video in the future by clicking right over here.